Hello and welcome back to our million part series about the Bible, the uh, infinite series, so to speak. And today we're going to be going through a bit of John the Baptist. So if you recall last time that we spoke, we had gone through everything that we had heard about Jesus' childhood, the escape from Egypt, eventually being left in the temple when he was 12 uh, by his parents, where he got into a little bit of trouble. And there are not so many, not so many parts of the Bible that actually discuss the, the childhood of Jesus. And I, I've always felt like this was a way of showing that it was probably like almost anyone else's. Uh, after all, he was a human. He was fully human and fully God. So the fact that they don't give so much detail, you could assume many, many things that at 13, he probably had a bar mitzvah. Uh, after that, he probably started to do the trades of his father, uh, Joseph, of course, being a carpenter. So that meant he would be working with wood. It also included stone carving at that point. So he probably was into that and he, and he was living a pretty normal life. So we meet John the Baptist and John, is actually cousins, the first cousins once removed. So John's mother was this woman, Elizabeth, and Jesus's mother, obviously, being Mary. John's father, Zachariah, was a priest. And it's always fascinating to me that John is quite literally part of that priest class, which what a priest would do is pick out the sacrifices that he would bring to God. And for that sacrifice to be legitimate and able to perform its function, you would have to have a priest do the, uh, do the ceremony and choose the sacrifice. Uh, you see this happen in Daniel when Saul does not wait for Daniel and just does it himself, and how displeased God was with that action. But here we have a legitimate priest of this priest class picking out what will be the ultimate sacrifice for the redemption of Israel and the world. So I like to think that Jesus and John knew each other. After all, they were cousins. Uh, they might have played with each other as children. They, they were not strangers uh, in any sense of the word. Uh, to give a little bit more background into the, the family history there, um, Elizabeth and Zachariah were very elderly and didn't have children. And they were visited by an angel who said that they were going to have a child who was going to have an incredible role in the kingdom of God and in what was going to come later on in this story. There are certainly parallels to the Mary and Jesus story. Years and years go by, and Jesus is doing his carpentry work. John would have been uh, in a priest class. So there was a bit of a disconnection, and they probably didn't see each other for a long time. John ends up living in the Judean wilderness, which... When I was a kid, I always thought this was like a foresty region and little animals running around, kind of like a Disney video that he had a little raccoon on his on his shoulder and little mice, and he, and he was nice. Now, I've seen some depictions of that, but in reality, this area was much more like a desert, something if, um, for you Texans out there, something like West Texas would be. This is why you get this description of John, that he would eat locusts and wild honey, because that probably was the only thing that would be really consistent that he could have a diet on. He had a long beard, he had uh, to get locusts stuck in the beard, and he would wear this, this sack. Uh, that was probably not too comfortable. So it's very reminiscent, I think, intentionally of what the old prophets were doing, what they look like. So God comes to John and tells him to start doing these baptisms, to start giving the word. 
and John, even though he's in the wilderness, starts to preach. And there's all these people coming from all over Jerusalem, all over Israel, to come to this distant part of the country that was not comfortable and get baptized in the Jordan River, which was probably the only water in that area that would be considered living. Uh, you couldn't, for many reasons, you probably shouldn't go into this stagnant pool of water uh, what flies all over it, but it's actually in the Old Testament that this needs to be living water for baptism. And there's quite a bit of difference between the Jewish understanding of baptism and the Christian understanding of baptism that ends up growing out of this. But at, the, at that time, it was not uncommon for ceremonies that Jewish people would do some kind of ritualistic cleaning. So there, there was definitely a knowledge of baptism. Uh, priests would get fully submerged sometimes before certain ceremonies. And so it's interesting to see how that changes over the years. So when John would baptize these people, there were some things that would happen. They would confess their sins, and then this would be a ritualistic cleaning. To better understand it, though, uh, it, it's about repent, repenting. Uh, and repenting is not just feeling sorry for what you did. It means a true change of thinking, a change of mind about your sin. Uh, that you turn to God because you need that help and seek mercy. This isn't, uh, I feel bad that I'll probably end up doing it tomorrow. So what John actually is uh, at this point is somebody who is saying that there is going to be this messiah coming that there is going to be this kingdom and to give a little bit more background about all that you would have to go back into our old testament so what the prophets would say was that the kingdom of god would coincide with the resurrection of god's people and a judgment and this was exactly what John was telling these people that you need to redeem for your sins because the time is near that you are going to meet God, you're going to meet the Messiah, and there will be judgments, but there will also be exaltation. The best example of this is Daniel uh, chapter 12, verse 1, where it says, at the end of this age, a kingdom arrives. There will be a time of great distress like none ever, and Israel will be rescued. Uh, even the ones who sleep in the dust of the ground, the dead people, uh, and, and everyone will either have everlasting life or everlasting contempt, whether or not they're willing to accept God in this way. But that was probably f about 400 years, the last prophet, before this event uh, even took place. So a lot of people uh, in the Jewish world were starting to think maybe this isn't coming. Rome had taken over. They had a worse situation than, it, than ever before. And the idea that a Messiah was going to come and just solve all this is probably pretty, pretty out there to them at this point. And it's interesting just to compare to the modern day Jewish audience, uh, something that I was um, not too long ago, is that they're still waiting. And it does seem like they have just given up hope on this of this idea actually ever happening. That's what the baptism was all about. Uh, that you repented, you're prepared to meet God, and that you need forgiveness of your sins. A lot of people don't know this, but baptize actually comes from a word to mean to dip, uh, to dip cloth at, at this time. And uh, people would put their cloth in a dye, and it would come out the color of that dye. So you've taken on the properties of what you were dipped in. And part of that belief that you're taking on, that was John's, was this idea <clears throat> that, a, uh, that a Savior was coming. And also that you would follow the Savior that John would ultimately decide on. Obviously, John wouldn't be the one deciding it that would be god telling john and john says that the the person that they're waiting for 
is going to not baptize with water, but baptize with the Holy Spirit. Uh, when he points out to G that Jesus is that person, he says, there behold, the Lamb of God, and tells his community to that he must decrease for Jesus to increase. So go follow Jesus. You think the ego, so, so many people who are in the religious world, that imagine one of them telling their whole congregation, hey, this guy is better than me. I can't even take off his shoes, which is another thing that he said that was what a servant uh, would do for, for their master. So he's saying, I couldn't even be a servant for this guy and go follow him. You, you would never see it. So it shows the ego or lack of ego of um, our buddy John. Now, there was a prophecy that foretold John. If you go to Isaiah 40, verse 3, it says, A voice is calling from the wilderness. It will make the rough ground be a plain. It will make way for this Messiah. And what's so interesting about that is that Isaiah, and you won't hear me get into numbers, uh, like chapter numbers, this chapter is half of this and times this. You won't, won't hear me do that. I, I tend to, it might it might be true, it, it, uh, it's just something that, that I don't think I know enough about to really talk about. And I've seen some people go really awry, those doomsday kind of prophets who have done this weird math and said, oh, the world will end this day, Harold Camping. And to me, there, there's nothing more disgusting than that. But this one's very interesting. So Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. It's my old hockey number, actually. Another, another coincidence. So uh, 39, the first 39 chapters of Isaiah map roughly to the Old Testament. And then chapter 40, chapter 40, is this prophecy of John the Baptist. The first chapter of the New Testament is exactly the same and about this very topic. So it just shows the, it could be a coincidence or it could be a God that, that writes scripture and actually has put this together and preserved it over all those years. And it's an amazing, amazing thought. And think about the mercy and the love of this God that he not only warned the people that he was coming, that the Messiah was coming, but he warned people that the person who was going to tell people that the Messiah was coming, was coming. And that's a, it never misses an opportunity. And I think that, that really shows a lot about uh, our God. Now you ask yourself, why John? Why this guy who is looking homeless and kind of eccentric and all the way out in the wilderness? That's a, a pretty easy question. Because God always chooses the unlikely. He wanted someone untouched, uninfluenced by the Pharisee. He wanted something that was the complete opposite of these people and the, the really pretentious uh, religious figures of this time who memorized all the words of the Old Testament, but clearly missed on quite a lot of the meaning. And that all the studying in the world, no pedigree, is a substitute for a devoted heart that seeks the word of God. And I think when a lot of us kind of sit around and think about who we were, some people are lucky enough that they found this truth early on in their life. And then some of us have just been, just been horrible, <laughs> just been truly, truly horrible. And when God picks you, which many of his apostles were like this, uh, Paul was uh, quite, quite, the, quite the character who punished people for being Christians and got people executed and tried his hardest. A lot of the apostles were normal guys, uh, these fishermen there. These weren't, you'd imagine there's a, that expression that, you know, you cur have the mouth of a sailor. <laughs> and I, I'd like to think that it hasn't changed too much. So the, the people that were the most important 
to Jesus and over that time were the people who were sinners and who had this change. So God doesn't discriminate when it comes to that. He, he picks people that are the most unlikely and possibly the ones that need it the most. So we'll get into the rest of this story uh, next time. But thank you very much for joining us. If you've got any questions, please feel free to comment or message, uh, like, share a billion times, and all that stuff. Uh, I've been seeing some good views on, on the other one, so it's really exciting to see that uh, people are following along and coming and that I'm not uh, not doing terrible. So, and you know, if, if I make any mistakes, I, I hope uh, I hope God corrects them in, in your part. It's unintentional. If I say anything wrong, please come to me and tell me that I did. I I appreciate it personally because I don't want to say stuff that's wrong. I I don't want to mislead and guide people in the wrong direction. So, if you got a criticism or anything, I'd be the happiest person to receive it because I'm here to learn as much as I'm here to teach. So, thanks again and have a great one.